My name is Sister Ann Sullivan, and I'm the founder and first director of White Violet Center, and currently I am on the faculty of St. Mary of the Woods College. Well, the center is established to shed light on the need for sustainability and education in all areas of eco-justice, uh, recognizing that all creation is interconnected and interdependent. Uh, White Violet exists to educate for a more sustainable future. And we do that by utilizing our own resources here at St. Mary of the Woods, which are considerable land, uh, the possibility of animals, which we have, and then the whole history of education in our community as well. Well, I'm a farm kid. I grew up in Western Illinois on a farm and have always felt connected and involved in the natural world. And I was complaining loudly to our general superior, with whom I was living at the time, about the uh, use of pesticides and herbicides on our land. And I think she finally got tired of hearing me complain and said, all right, make a proposal because I don't know for sure how to deal with this. So I did, and no one paid any attention to it. No one thought it was their uh, purview. But what really happened during that time was that lots of people, a lot of sisters, saw the proposal. One page, let's do this. We have buildings, we have land, we have people, we, can, we have a commitment to equal justice as a congregation, so let's do it. And surprisingly, we did. We didn't think about it for a while, we didn't rewrite it several times. We just said, let's do it. And that, it, literally, that's how it came into being. My name is Lori Heber and I'm the director of the White Violet Center for Eco-Justice at St. Mary of the Woods. Um, the White Violet Center um, and the land that the Sisters of Providence have here in St. Mary of the Woods is 1,200 acres of property. Everything from certified forests to certified organic farmland to um, organically grown gardens, about seven acres of gardens. We have pastures with alpaca, 47 head of alpaca here on the grounds. And it attracts a wide variety of people. We have tours, we have um, field trips, we have garden clubs, we have pilgrims and seekers and people just wandering in off of the road. And it's amazing to be able to show them this, this place and, and all of the abundance of land. And it really helps to uh, uh, create and re reconnect people with creation and with the land. You would see um, blueberry patches, you would see raspberry patches, you would see blackberry patches, orchards, um, places where we've um, tried and failed for the last few years to, to um, keep bees. Um, you would see our compost bins, you would see hoop houses and greenhouses and hoop house. Hoop house. Um, Hoop houses are high tunnels, uh, other people might call them, where we can extend the growing season. They're unheated um, houses where we can grow vegetables made out of uh, metal and plastic. They, um, they are not heated. They are passive solar, so they receive the, the heating and, uh, from the sun. Um, we're able to roll up the sides um, to uh, add air or roll them down to keep um, the warmth in. Um, and we're able to grow lettuce, um, spinach, and greens well into the season, sometimes all season long, depending on the harshness of the winter. Okay. Well, we have uh, lots of alpacas. Uh, we have 47 alpacas. We have um, uh, barns and pastures for girls and boys. We keep them separate because when you don't, you have an overabundance of alpacas. Um, but we have them all over the property. Um, you will see our orchards, you will see chickens, we, um, we have chickens, we raise them for eggs. Uh, we have new chicks that we're raising and we'll be adding to our flock. Um, you will see the beautiful trees. Um, it is St. Mary of the Woods and the woods are absolutely stunning. They've been well cared for for uh, many, many years. Uh, when I, uh, when I took the job and was just brainstorming some ideas of, of things that could be, could be done with this wonderful land and talking with the founder, uh, Ann Sullivan, Sister Ann, about possibilities, she stated that early on a study was done that indicated that there's some uh, windy knolls on the property that would be prime for growing grapes. The sisters at that time, when the, when the center was founded, weren't of a mind. 
However, um, they might, um, with the right business model, be interested in perhaps growing grapes for wine. Go for it, Lori. <laughs> <laughs>
I realized, I, though I knew sort of the academic piece, I didn't have any practical experience with farming. I mean, I grew up in a rural area, but um, so I knew it would sort of be a long haul in terms of learning. It's not something you just pick up in a short, like, three-month internship. So anyways, I spent two years on a farm in Wisconsin, a dairy farm. It was an intentional community that included adults with developmental disabilities. Um, so I found that integrated my uh, sort of interests in a lot of different ways. Um, but uh, I wanted to be closer to family. My family lives in Indiana, Ohio. So, um, And I, saw, I had connections with the Sisters of St. Joseph. And the former director here used to be a, a CSJ, a Sister of St. Joseph. And um, so there was a connection there and um, sort of integrated the White Violet Center integrated not only my spirituality or my spiritual heritage, but um, sort of this um, learning to, ca to care for the earth and um, an internship that sort of cultivated those skills. And it's been uh, wonderful being here for that reason. I, the staff is very knowledgeable, and um, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot invested in the interns here um, in terms of workshops offered or um, resources. There's a great library, um, and just yeah, I mean the the interns are treated very well. Uh, uh, we've had uh, s uh, several, well, uh, Robin's put together several workshops on, um, we met with our, uh, the person who farms our property, we talked about farm equipment, which was very e educational, and we, we've had one on herbalism, we've had one on um, uh, chicken, taking care of chickens, um, an alpaca uh, work 101 workshop, um, we've had one on weed identification and insect identification, uh, good agricultural practice uh, standards, um, yeah, it's been a full, a full gamma uh, of <laughs> education. Um, so lately, during the winter is a lot different than the summer. I mean, winter we're skirting fiber. Uh, after the animals are sheared, um, the fiber goes through a number of different sorting. Um, it's just sorting, and skirting is just sorting out the hay and the um, and the longer fibers from the shorter ones. So that's winter months. And then uh, during the summer, spring is a lot of seeding and um, starting plants um, that will plant a transplant in the summer. And so um, lately we've been, so I'll get up, um, come to work, and we've been starting to put, I mean, we have for a long time done a lot of transplants um, that were started in the spring, putting in peppers now. Uh, we put in just about uh, 300 so plants of tomatoes, transplants, um, eggplant. Um, so all of that was started in the spring and um, yeah, and after we get those in the ground, so we're starting to weed now uh, <laughs> about every every day is, includes a little bit of weeding. Um, yeah, that's about it. So we get uh, housing and uh, we get a full uh, money for a, a meal a day, but it's a, it's a big meal. And then uh, we get a small stipend to help cover other meals during the month. Well, I think, um, in terms of farming internships, it's always difficult because far agriculture, small farming doesn't make a lot of money anyway. So you, so you do a lot of work for not a little pay, but that's, um, but I would, I would sell the experience sort of in a, in a different way. I mean, um, I think it's, it's work worthwhile. I think the um, sort of the spiritual foundation that's, that's here in terms of mean, just meaning, meaning making <laughs> um, that's here is, is pretty uh, grounded. Um, and I think here, particularly, the, uh, the, the attention, the, um, in how much is invested in the interns, the, the education piece, I think, is super vital and, and how well we're treated as people and not just sort of hands to do work. <laughs> <laughs> so You're so I, much more than hands. <laughs> And I thought you said ants. So <laughs> no, ants. <laughs> and ants. Like worker bees, like worker ants. <laughs> There's that too. <laughs> I'm going to do an homage to Candace here, our mm -hmm. garden manager, and talk about the kale slaw, because um, kale's near and dear to her heart. So uh, my, one of my favorite dishes, and it's one we look forward to every year, whenever the kale is finally up, is um, to uh, very thinly slice kale, you know, take the ribs out, uh, thinly slice it. You can add pretty much any vegetables you have around. If you have chicken, if you have tofu, whatever, you can throw that in. And then you make a dressing out of some mayonnaise, soy sauce, ginger, and honey. Um, and that's, uh, that's just my very favorite slaw. And we serve it with a lemon balm iced tea, which is really good. <laughs> Good. And parties here are an amazing <laughs> sensory experience. Sisters. Well, no, I mean in terms of we oh, throw yeah. we throw like birthday parties or the staff throws both birthday parties and everyone will bring in a dish and um, yeah it's just a it's a miracle in your mouth. 
The White Violet Center has a tremendous amount of, of opportunities, I think, um, because of all the people who come and visit the grounds. I think uh, one, of the, one of my goals over the years is to create more of a self-guided tour so that when people come and visit our grounds, they know what they're looking at. They, we've tied a little bit of the history of this place to it and can help them understand why it is that we're doing what we're doing with that particular area of the land. That's one of my goals. The other is, you know, trying to help make this ministry self-sustaining. Um, a lot of that is going to have to do with improving um, our offering of food um, into the community. So between grants that we're able to obtain to help um, build the local food economy, um, to branding and selling value-added products, um, you know, I have like great, wine. like wine. <laughs> you know, these are things I think that we'll be exploring um, very soon in our future to help make the, the center uh, uh, financially sustainable. Oh, one of my favorite dishes, you know, I'm a foodie and I love to cook, so it's really kind of hard to, um, to, to really narrow it down. I'm really enjoying right now a, a radish and white bean salad. It is so good, it's making my mouth water just to think about it. And I'd never really done anything with radishes before, but cut them up and put them on a, on a lettuce salad. Um, but this is a wonderful mixture of white beans and radishes and capers and olives and lemon juice and olive oil, and you put it on a bed of lettuce and it just rocks. It's awesome. I'm Sister Donna Butler. I'm an archives assistant for, um, for the congregation. I also am a member of our Congregation Peace with Justice Committee. Well, as an archives person, I came to call myself the keeper of the stories. And many of the wonderful stories that I discovered told me that what White Violet Center was doing, we had done in some way through our history. And I was so excited to discover those stories because I knew a number of our sisters were still struggling with accepting what White Violet Center was for us. And so I thought I can make a difference by making the connection. And what I noticed was um, everything we were doing, like beekeeping. In 1898, we had a sister who was 78 years old, who had worked in a classroom all of her life, but had always wanted to be a beekeeper. She set up 35 hives, and her first yield was 750 pounds of honey. And today we know how important bees are to one third of our diet and what a struggle we're having now uh, to do that. We had, um, even Mother Theodore herself was out helping with the agriculture and of course we didn't use pesticides at that time. In her journals and diary is the whole planting schedule that they used. We had uh, cows, we had hogs, so we had livestock, we had horses. We had livestock at that time, and we have livestock now. So when you say that time, like what time are you talking Oh, this would have been back in um, the 1840s to wow. begin with, and then through our history, different ones, um, like the cows came much later, the dairy that we had. And in the early days, in Mother Theodore's time, we actually had sheep roaming in the ravine. And like we do carting of the fleece from the alpacas, they were carting the sheep wool. But unlike now, they had to send it out to be spun. And Mother Theodore said, we send it out to be spun at 10 cents a pound. So we were doing that kind of thing uh, with, with fleece, it, just a different kind of fleece. Um, orchard, we had orchards at that time. They planted various trees and um, they had so many apples at one time that they were selling some of those in town. So I call that the beginning of farmer's market. 
um, we had an herb garden and our, some of our sisters from France were trained in pharmacy, including Mother Theodore, because they had a commitment not only to education, but to care for the sick. So we made a lot of our own medicines and stuff. And uh, rosemary water that we would make, we would trade in town for other medicine that we needed, but didn't have the money to buy. And we had a sister who was, who traveled to the sick in the area in Mother Theodore's time, not just to ourselves, but she served the people in the area with the homemade remedies. Um, so there's almost nothing that my violin is doing today that we didn't do in the past. And um, what I also discovered in our constitutions that we hadn't paid a lot of attention to before was this comment. This particular religious congregation is called into being by God to participate as a community and extending the providential designs of God to all creation. Wow. And until we learned the universe story and experienced white violet, we didn't really pay attention to that uh, particular piece, nor did we pay attention to the fact that Mother Theodore called us Daughters of the Forest. And all of a sudden, that term became very important to us. And um, at one point, I made a retreat. I was walking through our nature trail. And I kind of thought, well, this was how the whole place was when she arrived. It was a forest. No houses, no people. And she was thinking, oh my gosh, how am I ever going to build an academy here and attract people? But. Um, so I thought about what it was like for them, and then I wrote this poem that connects what they did with who we are and how they experienced the land. And I called it Daughters of the Forest. Did you ever know we are all on life support? Oh, I don't mean respirators, tubes, and hospital things. I mean things like honeybees and trees, wind and water, sun and soil, farmers and gardeners, compost and creatures, darkness and light. Sisters Theodore, Basilide, and St. Vincent Ferrer, Mary Xavier, St. Liguori, and Olympiade, in a most intimate way, you knew these woods, this land, this, its seasonal struggles and abundant gifts. Your weary bodies knew how essential to your survival was living in communion with this land. May we never forget why you came. May we reverence with profound gratitude this woodland forest that fed and sheltered you, warmed you in winter's cold, and sustained your spirits with its beauty a humble partner in the mission of Providence. Teach us, our founding sisters, how urgently the signs of our time on planet Earth call us to be daughters of the forest. That's just beautiful. And when I read this to my spiritual director, I cried because I said, you know, when I was not here to support those sisters, in all the sacrifices they made. The land was here. The land supported them. Thank you, Sister Donna.